Leaders are called upon to make tough decisions. The tougher the decision, the more powerful it is, and it's up to the leader to make that decision. You know, frontline people can and should be making decisions as much as they can. Okay, you want to do that. If the leader's doing all of the work, excuse me, making all of the decisions, then nothing's being done. You don't move forward. Right? So you got to, but the leader is, stands at the top. Now, Jeff Immelt, the CEO of General Electric, has quantified this in, in his own way, and he said, my job as a CEO is to make between 12 and 17 decisions a year. If I make less than that, it's an asylum. If I make more than that, I drive good people away. In other words, what he's trying to do, and whether those numbers hold up, I don't know, but he's saying that the big decisions are mine, but I want my people, my senior leaders, and all the way down in the different levels at General Electric to be making their own decisions. So it's a good way of thinking about what it is I need to do. And often leaders have to make the tough decisions. It's not between right and wrong. It's usually not about the ethics of something. Those are pretty straightforward, at least we hope they are. It's the, between the hard right, the two rights, and what course of action. Do we buy this company? Do we develop it ourselves? Do we implement this process? Do we go in a different direction? And more importantly, on a people equation, I've got two talented individuals. Whom do I promote? Those are the hard right decisions. That's what the leader is and challenged to do. That's what only he or she can do, and it's his or her responsibility to make those decisions, the tough decisions. You know, the example of Robert Kennedy had that famous saying, some men ask why and others ask why not. And the, question, the word why is such a powerful, powerful word to gain information. But the trick is you ask from a, a position of wanting to know something, not as a prosecuting attorney. Why were you there on the evening of November 23rd? And what were you doing there? That's not going to encourage nice, friendly dialogue. It's more like, what if or why do we do this? What challenge assumptions? And it's not just why, the words you ask, but what can we do? How can we do it? And most powerfully, what can I do to help the organization. You know, there was a senior executive at Borders that's no longer there, and that she used to go out and shop the stores. And she always introduced herself and spent time with the, re the, the store managers and the assistant managers. Why? Because they knew their customers better than anyone else. But she would also say, well, what can I do for you? And when you say that as a senior leader in your position, that's such a gift. That opens the door to conversation. And that's the way you engender support for you. You gotta radiate confidence. You know, times are tough. You gotta be the person. You have to be the point person. You have to be behind your team, not with a happy talk all the time. It can be cheerful at times. You gotta sometimes be a cheerleader. You know, Bo Schembucker, a great coach here, used to say that the time to, to kick, a te kick a team, as was the word he used, was knock them down a peg, is what Bo meant, was after a win. You buck them up when they're down. That's when you do it. And that's what you need to do. Buck them up. Be there for your people. That's essential to leadership. I'm going to talk a little bit about motivation. And I, when I, we hear the topic of motivation, I know some of you are thinking, oh, wow, he's going to talk about how he climbed Mount Everest backwards. Or how maybe I walked across the Gobi Desert blindfolded. All right? Or swimming the English Channel with one arm tied behind my back. Well, first of all, I did none of those things. And I'm not going to talk about that. Motivation is not something that comes from a speaker, but I promise you won't tell anybody that. Um, it comes from inside of us. So think about what motivates you. What gets you up in the morning? And we're going to talk about some things, but I want you to think about that question. What excites me? What gets me up? What gets me going to class? What gets me out there? What makes me want to make a positive difference in this world, all right? That's what motivation is. Creativity, trying to tell you something. I believe that all of us have a sense of creativeness. Now, we all think, well, the artists are creative. Yes, musicians are creative. You know what? Scientists are creative, too. Environmental scientists are creative. Forensic scientists need to be creative, all right? And this, I did a little 
Maybe some of you know Frank Capra is a famous Hollywood director. He did, he did uh, legendary movies. It happened one night, Mr. Smith goes to Washington. Uh, it's a wonderful life. What I didn't know about Frank Capra was that his first job, he was an Italian immigrant, grew up in Southern California. He went to the Throop Institute, which is today Caltech. His first job, he was a chemical engineer. And he went to the Army and served in the First World War in munitions and came out and said, you know, I really don't want to be a chemical engineer. Got a job in Hollywood as a prop master, all right? And then got an opportunity to write and to direct and became a great director. So I think this a hunch is creativity trying to tell you something, something about his own life. You know, I want to do something differently. And it's a good example because when he was a young man your age, he wanted to be a chemical engineer. Became one of the greatest Hollywood directors of all time. Totally different career change. He was redefining his purpose. Now there's a wonderful quote from one of Indiana's greatest and proudest. They called him the Indiana rubber man, John Wooden. He had, came across a quote that um, I have used. My daughter even found it, and she used it in her planner. She's a university student, and I hadn't given it to her, so I was quite proud that she, it resonated with her. Do not let what you cannot do interfere with what you can do. And so often we look at organizations and there's a lot of resistance. There's a lot of, sometimes, inertia. And we think, oh, well, I, I can't do that, or my boss is going to say no, or my direct reports won't like that, or uh, maybe customers won't. And so we defeat ourselves with our ideas before we even start. So the challenge in leadership is do not let what you cannot do interfere with what you can do. Okay? And focus on what you can do. Leadership is about making things work with the materials and the resources that you have. And that's very critical. And I think all of you in the healthcare world know that. You know how to make things work. If, you don't have every, if all the pieces don't fall together, you can take care of patients. You know how to do it. So this is that kind of attitude that I'm asking you to adopt from a leadership perspective. What can I do for my team? So don't let what you cannot do interfere with what you can do. I can be a, a better communicator. I can be a better supervisor. I can be a better motivator. I can do those things. Why? Because I am in control of that. But it's something to reflect on. And it's a six-word memoir. And the story behind this is that it was... Um, Ernest Hemingway was once challenged to, could you tell a story in six words? Now, some writers might have flinched from that, but not Papa. So next day he came back, so the story goes, for sale, baby shoes, never worn. For sale, baby shoes, never worn. A little tells you a story, right there, six words. Okay. And so... What does that mean to us? So Smith College, and their, through their alumni network, said maybe we could ask our alumni and anybody to come up with their own six-word memoir. What works best for some reason is the rhythm of the words are couplets. Two words, two words, two words. Uh, triple couplets. So that prosaic example that came out, born poor, worked hard, died rich. So you could use this little memoir device. You could use it for yourself, personal, but your leadership self, all right? What is it you want to aspire? Challenge your team. What's your six-word challenge? And maybe it's not a memoir, but what, what should be our legacy in six words? What's our challenge in six words? And so these are just some starter questions. What gets you up in the morning? How do you help others? What are your points of influence? How do you want to be remembered? So this little memoir is a focusing tool. And if you use it in coupling, perhaps, with your peer coach, it might come to greater understanding. You may provoke greater understanding of self, your team, and what you can do for the organization. And ladies and gentlemen, that concludes the formal part of my presentation, and I'm happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you.